Holbrook New Media. This is Jeffrey K. Holbrook. Welcome to the audio feed from HolbrookNewMedia.com. Today, Jeff and Jeffrey, the weekly catch up. We hope you enjoy the audio version. If you want to see what we look like, I will embed the video for this episode at HolbrookNewMedia.com. Hello, everyone. I'm Jeff Blanchard. And I'm Jeffrey K. Holbrook, and this is the Weekly Catch-Up. And we're back. Yes, we are. And this... I think I'm going to have to change. I think I'm going to have to change the intro when you change your your web address or because that's got the Holbrook new media at the moment on that one. Oh shoot. That's going to cause a bit of a problem. Isn't it? <laughs> because that was from the old blab, wasn't it? So... <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, well, I'll give you an excuse to do a bit of, uh, after effects work anyway. Okay. That sounds, that sounds pretty good. Just, you know, whenever, whenever you get get around to it. Um, the big news is we had some interaction this week, uh, some feedback on the show. Oh, yeah. oh, we did. Never, yes. never, uh, don't waste your time. We'll stay at home. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, actually, it was very, very nice, very cordial. And we've been trading emails back and forth all week, actually. Um, what happened was, you remember on the last show, we were talking about um, the general relative um, quality of Kindle books compared to real books? Okay. Well, what... Uh, what I did was I needed to get the, uh, you know, the website address for the book that I was telling you that I read the Kindle book that was really, really a good uh, book and really, really super well done. And that was at thehappyhollisters.com. We had three of these books whenever I was a kid and loved these books. I mean, I just read them over and over and over again. And always was, like you say, a very, I was always a very ravenous reader, I guess you would say, for a little bit of alliteration there. But anyway, love these books. And I just thought there were three of them. You know, there was the original book, and then we had the mystery of Mistletown, and I'm trying to remember the other one. But it's young children solving mysteries and stuff, and they're really exciting and, you know, just just keep you glued to the page because, you know, you have something exciting, you know, coming to in the middle of a chapter and then uh, the way they're written, there's a cliffhanger at the end of each chapter, you know, and I mean, it just, it just keeps you want, wanting to go. Um, the Happy Hollisters, again, were, were probably absolutely my favorite books whenever I was a young child. And I never thought that I would actually have interaction with people who were involved in it. The books were, I'll just give you a little background real quick. The books were originally written starting back in the 50s by uh, an Andrew Svensson. He worked for a uh, large company that actually put out children's books, and the standard procedure was to have a pen name for a particular series, and then various writers that worked for the company would pen different episodes, basically, each book of, of these different series. And I read some of the other series, too, like the Hardy Boys and th things like that. Uh, these were mystery uh, series for older children. I moved into those later on. but. The difference between those series and the Happy Hollisters were that these were actually all written by the same guy, by Andrew Svensson, and they were modeled on his family. All right. Okay. And so there were there were five five children, and he took some of the information, uh, you know, about what he wrote in the books from the kids, uh, the local place where they lived in New Jersey, newspaper articles, interviewing other kids, things like that, and so. It turned out that I thought there were three, but there were, when I was was an adult, there in, I ended up being there ended up being thirty three of these books. And he wrote every one of them; nobody else did. Um, and so they were about his family and everything like that. Whenever he passed away, the company passed the rights to the stories to his widow. Now, uh, I found out about all the other books, and if you'll see right behind me here. Mm -hmm. That is my collection of the original books. Uh, if you put them out back on the long shot, you can see a stack of books back there behind me. There you go. Oh, yes. Sir. See that yeah. stack of books? Okay. Yep. I have the two of those are the original book. Uh, actually, well, one of them is actually right here beside of me. Here's, here's uh, you know, the, the original one that I have uh, with the still the cover on. And anyway... I have about 19 of them, and I've been collecting them. Well, I found out that back in 2010, they had started reprinting 
and making Kindle versions of these books. Again, and so like I said, I was collecting simply because I just loved them and I, I really wanted to read the rest of the series and I've been looking at antique shops and trying to find these old books. Well, now they're being reprinted again. Very, very good books. Uh, again, it's the teaching the children manners, you know, good, good manners, good work ethic, uh, polite, you know, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, everything like that. So anyway, I'll read you an email here in a second that I got um, from them, but I just got on their website and said, Hey, we talked about you in the weekly catch up. Um, and I gave them a link and said, start it around, um, 20 minutes in, and that'll give you a lead up to what we were talking about. And so we did that. Well, they listened to more than that because the email talks about other things that were in the show and a very, very cordial, uh, email. And what's happening is these books are being put out by the grandson of Andrew Svensson and his wife is the one Callie Svensson is the one that I was talking to. Let me read the uh, email to you here. Let's see, make this come up. Okay. Wow. Thank you so much. This could not have come at a better time for us. We're also on the Gulf coast of Florida, about 90 miles north of your family in Sarasota. And we were very fortunate to come through this past week, relatively unscathed. We've been very pleasantly surprised at how well the Happy Hollisters reissues are doing. And every bit of positive feedback, like your video, helps us to spread the word that the books are back in print. The author was my husband's grandfather, and the reissue project is a labor of love for the two of us, with everything done in our spare time. I can't even imagine how delighted Andrew Svensson would be to know that people are still talking about his books so many years later. What would he think about two guys talking to each other and broadcasting around the world from two separate computers in West Virginia and Australia? None of the Happy Hollisters would believe such a thing was possible. <laughs> Your thoughts on the quality of Kindle books were especially interesting. When we first set out to reissue the series, we were told that we could simply scan the original books. We tried that, and the results were disastrous. So we type and proofread from scratch each book that is reissued in paperback, then the Kindle version is a very simple conversion, and we've been happy with the result. All in all, it is an incredibly laborious process, but in our opinion, well worth the time. We're working on volume 20 now, and the process has gotten easier with each volume we've done. We've been able to fix errors and typos that were in the original books and work out kinks in the production system as we go along so that later volumes are turning out even better than the first few. Your kind words about the Happy Hollisters are very gratifying and much appreciated. We will keep moving forward with the reissues as quickly as we can to get to the 33rd volume. In the meantime, would you mind if we shared the link? Thanks again, Callie Svensson. Oh, that's really good, isn't it? That's nice. Uh, yeah, she listened to the show. And I mean, it's not like this generic push a button and send this thing. I mean, and so we've actually honestly been sharing an email back and forth uh, all week long. I think we're up to about six or seven messages or so. Very, very nice people. As a matter of fact, they seem to have the same values that are in the books, you know, just, you know, um, giving you more than what uh, what you're asking for, you know, uh, like that. So what I wanted to do, and I knew they had these, and I was planning on getting one at some point, was to get one of their T-shirts. All right. And so what I've got behind me here, let's see if I can go the way I need to. You can see the shirt back there. That is uh, one of the Happy Hollister's T-shirts you can get on the site. And so <laughs> I went ahead and uh, ordered one of those. And uh, they made sure it got here in plenty of time so I could hang it back behind me. But that wasn't all they sent. They also oh. sent one of the new paperback oh. copies oh. of the Happy Hollisters. It's one of the new paperback copies. And this is signed in the pen name of Jerry West, who, which is the pen name that was used to write all of these books. And it signed it on the inside, and it says... <laughs> get my glasses down here where I can see it. Jeffrey, thank you for being a friend of the Happy Hollisters, Jerry West. They also gave me a fancy bookmark. Mm. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I'm no, I'm I'm thrilled with it. And and like you say, it's just I mean I I didn't order these. This was just put in with the with the shirt, mm. and sure. uh, you know, and so now I have I have one of the new versions that are coming out, and the quality of this is excellent. I mean, it's just as good as the as the uh, the Kindle book I was telling you about, but. 
talking about, and again, I, I, I love these people. Well, next time we go down to Florida, I'll probably, we'll probably stop and see them. <laughs> My wife said something about that. We'll probably take them out to dinner or something. But uh, anyway, it's uh, we're really, really thrilled about these people. And like I say, I'm going to continue to uh, collect the books and everything. But the well, what they were talking about, the Kindle books, I think a lot of people really are taking the books, just scanning them and throwing them out there. Mm -mm. And not, and then they are shocking, but they're doing the proper thing, retype. Because Kindle can be excellent, but you've got to, you can't just scan. You've got to do something like in InDesign, put it in and publish it. Really go and do. You've got to do a good job at it, because anybody can put one up quickly. But mm -hmm. they look like they're doing a really good job. Because just looking at that book, it's the sort of thing that, as I said, I just love to have a brand new book, and that just looks. I look so envious because it just wait looks a minute, so wait a minute, wait a minute, shiny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the way I books love, smell. I love reading a brand new book that mm. nobody else has read. I've got more enjoyment out of it if it's just mine and it's brand new, and I don't like turning the corners up. I like to keep it as as good well, as I can possibly get it. Well, they they must have been thinking about that too because they sent me the fancy bookmark. <laughs> That's right. You can't lose your plate. So. Exactly. So how many are in the series? Uh, there's 33 total in the series. And mm -hmm. um, like you say, they, they are working on the 20th book now. 20th. Uh-huh. And okay. like you say, here's comparison of the two, the original, you know, and then here's the the new one. And, of course, here's the original. Now, the uh, like I say, these are older uh older things and the pages might be slightly yellowed or something a little bit but you know uh things like that but but i'm i'm really kind of kind of curious if they if i could find a typo in one of these books because i never found them i mean even as an adult i find typos i'm really good at catching typos in books and i mean established authors these fancy people like stephen king books i found typos in his books <laughs> you know i mean all these really established authors you can find it but i don't remember finding any in the happy hollisters and i guess they're fixing anything they find in the new ones and the thing is with that because it's such an, an old type of book mm -hmm. back then they were that so precise on spelling whereas later ones more modern ones uh, the computer will get it, but it never did. Sometimes it's the spelling might have been right, but it might have been the wrong word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the computers don't pick those things up. So exactly, but I, I totally yeah. appreciate the work ethic that these folks have. I mean, you know, they said, "Well, that's not good enough. We're going to do it. We're going to do it right." And they're doing it correctly. It's coming out really, really well. And again, and I know this is this seems corny, but it totally reflects the work oh, ethic yeah, and the moral bearing of the the actual stories themselves uh, you know i mean what do you want your kids reading mm. you know i mean do you want your kids reading something that you know might actually instill good manners and you know like what they're very formative i mean this is like you know four or five years old up to about 10 or 12 or so that kids are reading these books and that's a very very formative time and i will say that we didn't have a television during that period of time mostly i did a lot of reading these books really influenced the, my outlook on life. I mean, overall, you know, because it was in harmony with the way my parents were and, um, you know, the, the way they, they trained us and everything. But uh, just good, clean reading. And, and uh, you know, the, uh, there's uh, language in it that uh, isn't normal. Like, for instance, uh, the words like, oh, that's swell, you know, or uh, keen, <laughs> you know. And then and whenever something funny would happen, the oldest boy, he would go crickets, you know, like. What in the world, oh, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, this and the on their website they even have a thing, how to talk like a happy Hollister, you know, and there's there's a lot of the, the translations of a lot of the things like that. And uh I was thinking that a good title for this uh episode would be uh The Happy Hollisters are still swell. <laughs> That's what I was thinking it's got to be something like that. So yeah. happy Hollister are still swell. Uh, yeah, the happy Hollisters are still swell. Still swell, yes. I like <laughs> I just love that saying swell. Mm -hmm. I yeah. just think it's it just sounds so good though, isn't it? But mm -hmm. it's one of those ones that sort of died off these days. Mm -hmm. It did. Uh, I actually invited uh, uh, Mrs. Svensson to uh, actually come and be in the chat, but she said, well, actually, uh, one of the later emails, she said, well, actually, we're kind of technophobes. <laughs> and at the same time, she said, uh, we would probably uh, wouldn't do you much good <laughs> on, on a tech show. <laughs> 
<laughs> but anyway, it they really would because, like you say, if they wanted to talk some more about the uh, you know the mm-hmm. process of putting the books together, because putting an ebook together is tech. I mean, that's just the way it is, and they're doing a a tremendous job of it. And again, like you say, anybody who wants some good reading for uh, really young children or things you can read to even younger children, um, these they're adventurous. Uh, it keeps it keeps you glued to it. Even as an adult, you know, like you say, I'll be 54 here shortly. And I read this first one again here on, on the candle just a little bit ago. And I, and I enjoyed it as much. I've probably read that book 50 times over my lifetime. And I, I loved it. I mean, I just I just enjoyed it. It kind of brings back a lot of memories. I know but in the way we like all our audio things, but I'm even thinking, wouldn't they be great to record as an audio book? Oh, that would be swell. That's swell, because <laughs> you like them so much, it gives you another excuse to read them again, doesn't it? Oh, exactly. I, I, I'm, I'm used to the way they talk because, like you say, it's part of my life. So I would love to do audiobooks. If you guys are listening, I would love to do the audiobooks. <laughs> well, what, what, you, what you do, Jeff, you don't. What you do is you record a chapter and send it to them. Uh, yeah, I can do that. I can do that. What it sounds like and says, hey, I just thought I'd thank you for your, your great gift of, of the brand new book. So I just thought I'd record the first chapter for you. Hmm, there you go. Just because that would be, the, and if they, if, if they do like it, that will but, reach out and we'll do that. And so if they do like it, who's going to get the get the job to do that hmm. well you never know you never know like say we've we've been actually having a complete rolling dialogue back and forth all, all week long and i'm going to send them another um link to this show and uh, you know with the title of talking about them and, it and everything like that and you know she asked for a link of the other one to see if they could send people here <laughs> sure uh i don't know if you've noticed but we did get quite a few extra hits a few extra hits on the show from last week uh oh, than what we had been getting it's just your scintillating conversation. You see, they all come to listen to you because they've caught the the daily, you know, the daily daily chats and all that. So <laughs> what's he going to say to, what, what's Jeffrey K. Holbrook going to say tonight? <laughs> oh yeah, I don't think that's it. <laughs> like we were talking last week, oh, you gosh. know, I had a I had a uh, I had a viral video, and it still didn't really do much of anything for the audio podcast. Um, at HolbrookNewMedia.com, by the way. Uh, the audio podcast is is still getting just about what it did before. Uh, you know, and like you say, after 5 million people hitting my video, mm. nobody stayed. Everybody had, uh, I mean, and again, this isn't sour grapes at all. I, like I was talking about yeah. that last week. It's just that people are just looking for the next sensational video, and that one was last that's week's video. So you know. that, That's it. You know, yes, it's great this week, but that's why there, there are viral videos. Mm-hmm. Because it is. If, the, if people didn't go from one to the other, not, you would get none of these that get a billion views or something. It would be. Uh, but that's the thing is, the, get a billion views, but then two weeks later, nobody's heard about it. You don't. You would. You would have thought it never existed in, in the world at all. Mm-hmm. I was watching uh, uh, this week. It was a. Uh, uh, was it Mirror Black? I think it is a new show on Netflix, and it's quite a strange. It's an English show. But it's quite strange. It's about like the, the social media aspect of our lives and where everybody's driven by how people think about them. Hmm. And it was one of the one of the episodes was, uh, you know, like you get on your face, and people like you or dislike you or whatever. Mm-hmm. And this whole thing was that this fella had an argument with his wife. And she says, I don't want to know you anymore. I'm going to unfriend you. <laughs> or, I'm going to block you. But what it did, it blocked everything that he – so all she saw was a blob, and she couldn't hear him, and she, he, she, she couldn't say – and he couldn't hear her. You know, he could just say, but anything to do with him was blocked. Wow. And, and, and he couldn't see her, and she was pregnant, and she had a baby, but he couldn't see the baby. So it was really <laughs> – taking technology to the other level that says you're blocked and as he said so don't do that up and so she had the final word because she was the only who could unblock him but he went through the life without being able to see anything but it was it was quite a good show and there's there's a few different ones like that with uh uh showing this one about likes oh i like that but every in it was a part where person had every interaction you had with a person You'd come with the phone. Oh, hello, Jeff. He said, "Oh, hello, Jeff." And if you see, him, you'd swipe. It said, "That I like." That was a five. And so you, everybody got a score. Says, "Oh, you're a forty-two point five. 
come along to our party and do that. Don't invite him. He's a 20. <laughs> so like all of a sudden, all of a sudden it's like a credit score. It was. And then it was like this <laughs> woman got invited to her best friend's wedding because she was a 42 and she was trying to get up to a 45. And if people, if people who had high scores gave you a, a thing, it counted for double points. Mm-hmm. All that, and she was on the way to the the wedding, <laughs> and she the plane got cancelled. So she actually swore at the person at the counter. I'm sorry, miss, that's not acceptable. We're going to deduct, oh. you know, forty points, and then the police got. Oh, they said, well, you're on double demerits now. So when anybody and everybody in the queue voted her down because of <laughs> all the and oh no, and then she got to about a fifteen, and then her phone friend a friend phoned her up said, well you. Don't bother coming to the wedding. I'm not having a 15 at my wedding. <laughs> oh my gosh! I mean, that would that would be something that eventually makes somebody commit suicide or something. But that's what it was sort of. I thought. I mean, your hey, whole life is yeah. It's science fiction, but I wouldn't be surprised. But you know, there's so many people <laughs> that think like, "I'm going to friend you. I'm going to unfriend you. I'm going to block you." But it's quite it was uh, that's quite a good show if you get to watch it. Mirror Black, I think it's called. Mirror Black. But there's so many really strange things on there and there was uh, another one about blocking part of a, a similar one where this fellow he'd done something really bad and all that and he got this said okay we'll let you off because you helped us do that but just to let you know yes you can but you're blocked from everybody <laughs> so he went out to the wheelchair he was the only one nobody could talk to they could see him but he couldn't all he saw was all these blobs walking around woof, 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 and he couldn't interact with anybody so he said no we're not going to send you to prison we're just going to block you from everybody in the world <laughs> uh, Good. That's, that's that's solitary yeah, yeah. He said that was, <laughs> I mean, this, is, this is really satirical i think i think it would be really funny <laughs> oh, I, mean, I, I couldn't stand that because i wouldn't mind being on my own but i'd hate to see all these people just go, boom, 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 all these blobs going around that you knew there was somebody there that you couldn't interact with them and everything but it was it was quite a strange thing about as well one of the episodes had uh did one about uh what was it uh a cookie you know how we call a cookie on the internet mm-hmm. which what they called a cookie there they implanted this thing into your brain and it stayed there for a week yeah. and then they take it out and it sort of uh duplicated copied your brain and it was you when they took it out but they put it into a thing like uh you know i won't say any of the things you know these voice things where you say a particular word and plays music or does all that so it put that brain into one of those machines so it was you and it was showing this fellow who had to convince the cookie that it wasn't the person that it's meant to look after because it was you. But it, it said, no, you're just a copy. And said, well, I'm not going to do anything. So it was it was quite how he got said, well, you're bored, bored to tears in this box. If you want to do anything, you better do it right. But the whole story was that that thing knew you down to anything because it knew exactly how you liked your toast it knew what you liked to order eat so it would eat order your food for you and do all these sorts of things but i thought all this all this thing all the whole show's got these things to do with social media and all the different things that we were relying on everybody walking around with phones and not being able to interact with people if they don't have phones but i thought i hope we don't get to that stage that uh, we can't put the phones down and just have a, a conversation with people. So I think that's really strange. There are a lot of people that are really, really having, I see people texting to each other in the same room at work sometimes. Mm. I mean, they'll be on the other side of the room. There'll be a group of people on one side of the room around a table and a group of people on the other side of the room at another table. And they are texting to each other mm. sometimes. And uh, it's kind of like, Oh, okay. Uh, all you have to do is just turn around and say, Hey, you know, <laughs> there they are. And, you know, and that's what I was seeing on the, one of the things that it was saying this week about interaction with people is yes, we may, might go to work and talk to people, but when people go to meetings, they sit there before the meeting starts on the phone, looking, checking, said, leave your phone at the, your desk, go into the meeting. And then you said, Oh, how are you today, Jeff? Oh, how's the wife? <laughs> I hear she's a bit ill. Oh, no, she's over that better. Oh, now let's start the meeting. 
but nobody does that. They just yeah go in there. But as I said, because we've all got their things to check, and all doing that when they've got a spare moment, they're always checking the, their social media or doing their emails. But if you leave that alone, that's what makes bonds in workplaces and with friends, isn't it? You, like how many times do you see people sat there when they're going out with friends waiting for the meal to come? They don't talk. They're all on the phones hmm. looking at pictures or the internet or doing something else. Uh, really strange. <laughs> uh, yeah, and the thing is, uh, then you start the meeting cold without anybody <laughs> having spoken to each other at all because everybody's communicating with other people outside of the room. And then all of a sudden, there you are with, uh, you know, hey, <laughs> you know, the, all of a sudden, oh, uh, yeah. And actually, to get so involved in your phone, and then all of a sudden, you don't know when the meeting's actually starting. And somebody has to speak up and hey, hey, hey everybody, you know. It was started. <laughs> yeah. I think that the whole thing was uh, I was listening to one of these talks that somebody was having and I said it, it said it's the generation that'll be told, Hey, you can have anything you want. He said, That's not true. You get out there, you don't. You don't always win. You get to work, you come last, you lose. <laughs> he said, But they've been told, no, you participated. You did well, but no, sometimes you haven't. <laughs> but it, it said, and everybody that, doesn't always get a trophy. <laughs> it said, but the people blame the you know the younger ones for that. It says it's not them. <laughs> it says it's the people who's brought them up mm -hmm. that's that's Motley done that. It just said it's so, and it is really it's quite sad that it's not the when they ever bl blame people. It's usually not them. It's just that's the way everybody. Uh, brought up these days and so you can do whatever you want and you can nobody's a loser everybody's a winner that might be nice but i think sometimes you, you know when you get out into the workplace well no that's not always true is it <laughs> well no 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 there, there's a rude awakening whenever you get out of the educational system and then you go into the real world because the real world is just as rough and tumble as it always has mm -hmm. been the only thing that's changed is what they told you to think about the world and then you get out there and you find it's a very, very brutal place. Your employer, you know, unless you have a small company and everybody's friends and things like that, if you work for any type of large corporation or anything like that, they don't care what you think. I mean, no. I mean they, they have a, a motive from the top, a mission, and you are a cog in that wheel, <laughs> you know, a cog in the, the little motor. And, and, you know, if you stop working, they'll, trade it out and put another cog in just like you do with any motor to keep everything running smoothly. What you think or how you feel or your aspirations, unless they line up specifically with the way the company needs something and you happen to be going in the same direction, then they may care uh, about what you need only because it facilitates what they're looking for, but they're not there to fulfill your dreams. You're there to fulfill theirs. <laughs> Saying one of these other ones of these shows and this show i got onto it was quite mesmerizing i watched watched one but i started watching about five or six different shows of it because one of the shows were was based in the future where you know we've got automations doing everything so there's nothing really for us to do we don't need to work but the government needs to pay you so there's got to be something so this fellow was you know, got a huge screen in his apartment just this little just buy it like a cube, really, with his apartment. Gets up, goes to work, but the daily work is thousands upon thousands of these treadmills. You know, the not tre no, the bikes. You know, the, like the exercise bikes. Mm -hmm. And the faster they pedal and the further they go, they earn money on there. And the more time they spend on the bike, the more money they can amount. And they do different things on that. Then the bet more money they've got, the better things they can buy for themselves. Hmm. And one points. of the <laughs> And that, yes, but then they had different things, like if you got enough points to go on to one of the TV shows because you bought your way on to be a star, and then you got so many millions of points for doing that. That's the only way you could get on in life, to get yourself ready so you could get on to one of these shows. And it was a bit like that, so earn yourself more points. But I thought, <laughs> then everybody, and they had all the different people in there, and the people, you saw the ones who wanted to be successful that got a million points. But they're the ones who got up at five o'clock and didn't leave till nine. Then you got the happy Joe. He, yeah, I've rolled up at 10 o'clock and he leaves at two, but he's only got 1,500 points sort of thing because he can't be bothered. He doesn't want to. He, he's just 
I, he's just happy just living and doing the you know the extra thing and everything you did while you're watching while you're pedaling you've got your big screen watching you pay for it so he says oh i want to watch that movie oh well that's 10 credits but mm. all everything i want to and this fella he wanted all this money so he you know, i'll just have an apple and something little for my lunch or i'll eat something that people left over so he didn't have to spend anything so all his money could mount up so he could get onto this show but it was all quite strange where you think that's where we might be heading eventually because when you, if you get automation and every well what do we all do <laughs> as I said because if the if there's money coming in the big companies making they're taxing them so they'd have to have everybody on those standard sort of wage, wouldn't they? So well, it seems, you'd have to keep them engaged. Well, it seems to me, you know, I work in a production type of business, and it seems to me that every time we get a new machine or some type of automation, that they basically have to hire more people to deal with it. <laughs> that's, 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 that's just the, what, it, what it seems to be. But I did have something funny happen, happen the other day. It's been several shows ago. I was telling you that, you know, I passed my 30th anniversary where I work and, Excellent. and that, and that, you know, a friend of mine got me a couple dozen cookies because he felt bad because I hadn't got like a 30 year pen or anything. You know, because when you pass 30 years, you're supposed to get some kind of a pen. And, uh, you know, I didn't get a 30 year pen. And so he felt bad. And so he gave me, uh, um, he got me a couple dozen cookies that these people were selling very, very good cookies. And that was probably more appreciated than a pen. However, I just now passed my 31st anniversary where I work at in back in August. Anyway, I was just online looking at, I just found out that you can look at your personnel folder online. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so so you can see the different uh, forms. You know, have, when you have a status change, they have something called a Form Fifty, and you know you can look and see what the change was. Well, you changed jobs, or you received a raise, or you know a cost of living adjust. You know, stuff like that. All of a sudden, I saw this form that said "other," mm. and I clicked on that, and up on the screen pops an actual scan of a thirty-year pen memo for me. Oh. Okay. It's in my file, but I never received the pen or the memo or anything. I have no idea where it's at. It's probably sitting in a desk drawer somewhere where I work. <laughs> but it's in don't my personnel me. file that I got it. <laughs> don't tell me it got lost in the post. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but the, it is entirely possible. They, they, they have no, but there, I, there was this one guy I heard one time that some supervisors were cleaning out a desk or something and they found three pens. Like a 10 oh, year, a 20 okay. year, and a, or something like that. And they gave them all to him at the same time. But I, I have not received it and I haven't asked about it at work. It's just hilarious that, you know, it's been more than a year since I should have gotten it. And it's sitting somewhere, you know, mm -hmm. but, uh, but uh, according to my personnel folder, I actually received this pen. So it's, uh, oh, but it's at funny. At least it's, at least it's nice to know that you, they did. Do, do there was a pin for you but it's just somewhere got lost so yeah was... I, it doesn't i don't think it, the delivery of the pin is the only thing that takes human interaction i think they're probably automatically generated with anniversary mm. dates and stuff like that all of a sudden this memo comes out and then it's like oh okay this guy is supposed to get a pin and so you know then they send it to the plant and all of a sudden nobody notices it or they say, well, I'll give that to him. And then all of a sudden that supervisor gets transferred or something like that. That's so, right. you know, so it's, it's probably sitting somewhere. They usually send it to your manager and he's, oh, I'll give it to him. And if something's gone and they've just forgotten all about it. It's got laid, put to the side somewhere and it never mm. happened. So like yeah. you said, yeah, I'll and then they get transferred and they're not coming back to your department or something. You know, once I, once I retire, it'll, it'll probably show up and yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I told uh, the guy, the, the guy that felt bad and bought me the cookies, I told him about it and he just thought that was the funniest thing ever that, yeah, I actually got it, but I didn't actually get it. <laughs> just really funny. <laughs> you must be like me. Cause I don't like moving uh, jobs either, but it's to say I'm, with my current job, I'm up to 16 years. And the only reason it would be 16 years is because, well, the, my original job, it would be, it would be over 30 years I would have been mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. but it's just that the original business went out of, out of business That'll and I was it. there, I was there 13 years. Mm -hmm. And then and the next one I was at, at for Sony was there for three years, but then they centralized and moved, you know, made everybody redundant. So 
that was I was that wasn't my option. And then this one, I've been there 16 years, but as I said, I, I, but some people, are, I just can't believe, like you said, there's people there that's been there 40 year anniversary, and you think, goodness me, and there's other people that's done longer than that well, as well. And you, it's, it's, but I'd love to be able to do that, but I don't think I'll live long enough to get that price. <laughs> well, what, what what happens is what happens is where I work at, you have employment. You know, I work for the U.S. Postal Service. I've been there 31 years now. I have employment with them, but I have held 10 or 15 positions. Mm, and so we right. have bid cycles <laughs> once a month, and I can bid to another job. I've bid the different mm. shifts, different schedules. You can give yourself a raise or a pay cut based on whether you work at night or whether you work during the day because of differential and different things, work weekends, things, things like that. And so... You know, a lot of times it really works out well because, for instance, uh, you know, it's just a 24-hour-a-day business. It happens all day, all night, you know, everything. Well, if your kids are in school, you know, having sports things you have to take them to, have to take them to school, there are schedules all around the clock starting at different times on all three shifts that you can bid to with whatever day's off. And, you know, with as you get more seniority, you can bid and go to these other jobs that work better with your family life. Or if you don't have one, like right now, the schedule is not as important simply because it's my wife and myself. She's disabled, so she's not working somewhere else. And so it's just my schedule. You know, the cat doesn't have a schedule. So, you know, we're sure. <laughs> and so and so it's just my schedule and I can be off or not whatever days of the week I want. I want to retire in a couple of years or so, so uh, I can shift my schedule to where I'm making more money by working a bad schedule for other people who have a lot of activities going on, make more money and make it easier for me to retire as I pay things down quicker because I'm making more money. So, you know, you can go for the money or you can go for the schedule or, or whatever. And so I've bid all around and been on different shifts and done different things while still being employed in a single job with the postal service, just by holding different positions as I moved around. Um, if you get bored, you can bid somewhere and go, you know, do something different. <laughs> I must admit in my, in my time that you do, you, you stay at a job a long time, but a lot of people think staying at a job, that that's the only job it's going to be, but you've got to make of it what you can. And like you said, you, when you're there, you can get other jobs within that. So it's like leaving the, place and get going a brand new job but with the, in the same place that you like with the people that you like working with so mm. i'm always very happy with the with the with what i've done in my work life because i actually enjoy going to work so and i thought well that's good because you spend most of your life doing it mm. so it's good <laughs> yeah. it's enjoyable and i like the people i work with and they said you spend more time with the people you work with than usually your family so <laughs> that's just as well that you do do get along with them but mm. uh, i mean I just think I'm so fortunate that you do enjoy it because there's a lot of people who just get up and go to work and hate every minute of it. So uh, uh, there's a uh, there's a there's a lady in my current department, and I looked at her the other day and I said, "You know, we have known each other for over thirty years, and we've never got each other upset even once." And she goes, oh. "You're right. I hadn't thought of that." <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, because there's some, you know, people have opinions, people come in with bad moods or whatever like that. And then some people are just grouchy, you know, all the time. Uh, you know, and again, when you work in a large place like I do with, you know, a few hundred people around, you're going to run into all different flavors of people and their attitudes and whatever. But this, this lady here is just a very polite, sweet lady. And, uh, again, we've worked together several times, depending on what jobs we had. And we're working together again, actually in a cage right now, a security cage. <laughs> <laughs> and so cage. they have, they have a cage place. match. Yeah. They have us in a cage. It's a security cage for like registered mail and stuff like that. But, uh, anyway, we're working in there and, uh, I, I love working with her. She loves working with me and we get along just fine. And it just occurred to me that we have never even once got on each other's nerves in 30 years. Just nice having mm. people like that. <laughs> It, it it is, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. they, they know what you want, you know what they want, and you just get on with it. And mm -hmm. so that's that's it. So that that's really it. good. And that's what, as I said, that's why you don't you have been there thirty years because you you get along with the people as well that you do that with. So and and that's 
often. And if you don't, if you don't, and you're in a place where somebody is really being a grouch all the time, then you can either bid away from them or they can bid away from you. Or, <laughs> you know, if a supervisor doesn't like you, you can just, one of the things I've noticed that we're there, the supervisors are constantly changing over the years, but we're still there. That's right. That's right. Yes. You don't get too high in that. You just do it a certain, certain way. You don't want to be one that goes, but like you were saying though before, that they'll bring in some automation to make life easier. <laughs> to, yeah, but there's usually employ another five people to, because yes, it might make life easier, but they can do so much more, th more throughput. It brings other things on. So they need more people to load the trucks because there's more mail coming and they can sort it faster. It's getting out there quicker. And they thought there's always something like they had the, the paperless office. Okay. Yeah. You get rid of all these things, but there's just so much more, before emails and before how easy it was to communicate with people, you didn't have that to worry about because you couldn't do that. You couldn't possibly get that message to everybody. You couldn't possibly do that. You never knew that they couldn't get back to you within five minutes knowing you've done it wrong and you had to redo it. It usually took days before that happened. Mm -hmm. But now you do something, and if it's wrong, you get a notification in five minutes. No, that's not right. And then somebody else, it's just... Yes, it, things are a lot easier, but there's uh, a lot more jobs out there. But the thing is, is people sometimes just got to adapt and retrain to these positions. That's the problem sometimes. You know, well, okay, there's all these, they get rid of 5,000 jobs. There's usually other five, but are they, can those people do those jobs? That's uh, the problem sometimes, isn't it? Yeah, and in, in a large organization, they have a tendency to want employees that have higher pay because they've been there a lot longer and have seniority. You know, every so often at the Postal Service, every 20 years or so, they redo the pay scale. They did it before I got there, and so I'm I'm making less than the people who were there two or three years before me and like that. And there's still a few of those people around, not too many. And then they did it again about four or five years ago, and uh, I'm making more than the other people I'm working with. And so it's it's, you know, kind of a kind of a thing but everybody's used to the idea that the longer you work there the more money you make and so the older employees they really would like us to kind of get tired and leave so that they could pay somebody less money to do the same job <laughs> yes uh, they'll say oh, what do you like to do this here i've got a nice job for you to bid for because yeah. then they know that they're closing down that line after a month so <laughs> But would that happen if you bid for some sort of job and you could get into one or you, you wouldn't get one where they might be closing that division down or would you be stuck with that if you bid for that? Well, it is funny. Okay. I have, I have a lot of, I have a lot of seniority. As a matter of fact, I'm not like number 33 on the seniority list for clerks. So there's 33 people ahead of me. And so whatever job I decide to bid for, there's a much better chance than if you're number 208 that you're going oh, to get okay. a job that you bid for. Now there's also jobs that are best qualified. So, you know, you can, mm -hmm. that's an even kill with me and somebody who's been there a year, you know, it depends on your qualifications. But as far as the bidding thing goes, whenever I bid to the job I have now, I found out that I had won the bid because the union clerk craft director came to me and said, why did they do away with your job? And I said, what? And he said, well, the job you're on right now, they're they're getting rid of it. We just got notified they're getting rid of it. I said, well, I must have got that one job I bid on then, <laughs> because there's this there's this constant thing. They're allowed to have so many jobs in the in the place, and so they needed this other job in another place. And you know, as of as you can imagine, there's large numbers of certain types of jobs that you know. And so on different schedules, you know, to make sure everything gets done over the course of the 24 hours and my job, they decided, I mean, I'd been, I'd been over there doing this job for a few years and all of a sudden I bid from it to another job and I didn't even get out of the job before they abolished the job so they could make another <laughs> job somewhere else doing something else because they're only allowed to have so many jobs in general. And so I was thinking, you know, that really makes me feel like I was contributing at that last job, you know? <laughs> But at least it wasn't like the pen. At least you you knew about the job you bid for, rather than you being at home to have. Well, where do I? What do I do tomorrow? <laughs> oh, oh yeah, that would be that would that would be rather nerve wracking if suddenly the money stopped coming in. Yeah, you know, for everything you've planned for. But they haven't given you redundancy, so the I must have a job somewhere. So mm -hmm. yeah, well, that's so. Yeah, there's there's 
layoff protection, things like that for people at my level, you know, that uh, come, come with the contract. It's a union negotiated contract job. So, um, you know, you end up, you end up with certain perks and benefits and things, things like that after you've been there a long, long time. Um, but again, um, up high, the people that don't actually know me, uh, would like me to leave somehow so they wouldn't have to pay as much to mm -hmm. get the job done. But the local supervisors, um, like having me there because I am easy to like get along did. with as far as new people. And I don't mind training new people to do things. And, you know, um, I, you know, I'm there, to, I'm there to give them a good solid day's work. And I do, <laughs> you know, so, so that's, yeah. that's, that's all you're asking for, you know, is that, that you day's work that they paid you for. What do you find in a lot of places when somebody like yourself and that leaves from that, and then they get somebody that's much cheaper. Mm -hmm. You usually end up employing three people to do the job that you did. Uh, and then there's about the same thing, but the employed three people because the younger ones can't do it or don't do it as well. So, well, like you say, well, you know, if, if you don't have the, the lifetime experience, there's that life learning things that you know how these things are happening because you've watched it happen. I know my uncle was a mining engineer, and when he retired, they hired two college graduates at probably the total salary he was making or less. They hired two mm -hmm. of them and they kept calling him to ask him how things were, how to do things and you know, what was going on. And so he set up a consulting business and charged them every time they called him. <laughs> so, so you should do because the, the said you're not doing free. Well, if I'm going to contribute, yeah. you can pay for that. Yeah, that. You know. the, the poor college graduates wasn't their fault because you said a lot of what you do and how you quickly you do it is because of the knowledge that you've uh, earned along, learned along the way mm -hmm. from your years of service. So you know you can do it quickly this way because of all the interactions you have. But somebody just coming in and said, well, this is how you do it. How do you get it done so quickly? But uh, you know all the, all the bits and pieces behind it. Well, that's at the same time. Uh, there's this general assumption I know in America that – if you have a college degree, you are the smartest person around. Whereas if you have a college degree, you are a specialist in a specific field. It doesn't mm. mean you are all around generally the smartest person in the world. Um, and again, it doesn't mean you're dumb, <laughs> but it, it means that you are a specialist in a particular area. Then there's work experience. And yes, while you're getting your degree, you do learn skills you know, mm -hmm. about study and how to analyze problems, and things like that. But people also learn similar skills in the workplace if they learned it or the school of hard knocks is the way they say it around here. Just the way you 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 learn the same type of life skills a lot of times by working in the workplace as you do getting a degree. But the degree is a very specialized type of a thing that makes you not the smartest person in the world, but a specialist in a particular area, you have your degree, but now you have to get work experience and actually apply that. And then we'll see how smart you are. <laughs> yeah. I just, it just makes me wonder. I just think back to when I was 16 and what I know now from when I was 16, you just think none of it came from school. It's all from life experience and what you've done mm -hmm. and, where you've done been and what you've done. And it's just quite amazing what you do learn in life. And people don't, I don't think people appreciate what ex life, just experience in life, what, what the skills it does give you, because you do, you do learn a lot out there, but it's something that you can't get, you can only get with time. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that is entirely true. And I find that the other half, I have life experience, but the other half of what I've learned came from, Basically, reading, happy. reading books. I mean, yeah. and, and I learned things. Okay. For instance, one of these books, we had three of these when I was a kid. And I know I keep bringing this up. <laughs> happy Hollisters.com, <laughs> by the way, the happy .com. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> product had, placement. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Product <laughs> placement. Yeah. But we had, we had three of these books and one of them, um, had a, a deaf child in it mm -hmm. and they had the finger spelling alphabet. Because during the course of the mystery, they had some things where they had him reading lips with some binoculars and they had to be quiet. And so they were fingerspelling to each other what was going on. And it had that in there. 
off of a children's book, I learned how to finger spell, you know, sign language. And so there's all these little skills that you can pick up and learn out of books, out of things that you see, out of things you watch on TV, a documentary or whatever like that, or talking to grandpa Mm -hmm. or, or talk, I mean, uh, okay, again, I'll be 54 here shortly and I still love to learn. You know, people, Mm -hmm. people think that they, that they know everything that they're ever going to learn. I love learning too. Well, every day there's more out there to learn. There's these little facts that come by that suddenly it pops out and you say, oh, okay. You know, we were talking in the last show about, you know, the technology going all the way and then trying to figure out how to start a fire. Well, I learned by watching one of those videos on YouTube at one point that you can just take steel wool, take a 9 volt battery, put a little bit of tinder on top of it. I mean, it's the easiest fire starting out. It's easier than striking a match. And, uh, you know, and so that's one of the things you could do, or there's other ways of starting fires. Um, a guy one time said, uh, hey, what about this? And there was this historical fact and this and this. And all of a sudden, five phones come out. 20-year-olds are looking at the phones, and they finally, you know, they, they get the information. They come up, and they blurt out what it is. And a friend of mine that used to be a college professor turns around and looks at me, and he says, I find that almost offensive because I spent so many thousands of dollars to learn this in college and all they have to do is pull up a phone and they have all this information available. And I said, there's one big difference. They have access to the information as long as the internet's up. You that's know right. this stuff. If that's right. You actually know it. And so there's a big, big difference in having access to information that could go away or that you actually know these things and can pull these out because the first thing they're going to do is whenever everything hits the fan, if it ever does, or some type of terrorist attack or whatever happens, the person who's the most popular is going to be the person who knows the skills that are needed right then for whatever happens then. Yes, definitely is going to be that, isn't it? Because so, yeah, what happens when the internet goes down? And there's going to be a day that it will happen like when people like you hear a news story if if some internet provider if the lost service for half an hour well cell phones if a cell phone carrier loses connection for two hours it's nearly the end of the world isn't it there was no calls for three hours on the cell network <gasps> like what are they going to do compensate it's cost costing business a fortune so dangerous I thought, my goodness, this is years ago. We never had them 30 years ago, did we? It was <laughs> no cell phones in that sense, and life went on without them. Oh, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, that was that, that was whenever you, you walked to school, you know, a half mile in each direction, uphill and in the snow each each day. <laughs> you know, like you know, just, just the primitive stuff. But it is funny, though. At work, there are people who are known as specialists in particular things. Somebody told me yesterday, they said, uh, I'm the guy people come to talk to about starting a podcast. You know, I'm just, okay. Everybody knows I'm the podcast guy. I've been doing it for like three years. So, But somebody came up and said, um, well, we want to talk about a podcast. And so you weren't here. So we talked to Jonathan and we're talking about Jonathan Gill, who's going to uh, be the guest co-host on October the 2nd, um, you know, for this show. And uh, he'll be, he'll be actually sitting right here in the chair and we'll be, we'll be the guest co-host, but where I had helped him start his show. And now he's starting to be recognized as somebody who knows about podcasting. And so I wasn't there. And so they went to Jonathan and he I, was, he, he was telling them about how, how to start a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and so, you know, there are, there are the people who, who, you know, know things, but then, and that's our, our age group do that. But then a lot of times people will immediately consult their phone and not go ask the old guy that knows about carpentry or the guy that knows, you know, how to fix a, a crack in a concrete, you know, or in a stone wall or, you know, something like that. They'll just start while trying to find a video on it because our generation is used to talking to people about things mm. and the younger generations are used to just consulting the phone. Um, but it still it still amazes me though that this because I, I wanted to do a few more videos on different things, but I keep thinking there's so much out. Everybody's done that, mm-hmm. and then you've just but nearly always there's something that you can do that 
somebody will look at yours and think, I understand that better. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, I understand where that's coming from because some people can do it really well. I've seen other people can ex do these things on how to do things, but it's so damn complicated. I just can't be bothered watching. <laughs> uh, it just does my head in sometimes. You know when you get to the there's too many. Uh, no, I can't be bothered. But some people you watch, it might be exactly the same complex thing, but they're easy going. They just say it so easily and make it so much more effective. So as I said, well, I was saying last week, put in your bit. It doesn't matter if somebody else has already done it. Mm -hmm. Somebody else, there might be a group of people out there that will appreciate the way you've done it. Like there was one thing that I was saying to, to Rick about ages ago, and I don't think anybody ever done it in audition. How to get a when you one of the main features with it that everybody seems to use, but I couldn't see any uh, YouTube's on it. So if you get a forty-minute audio thing and you want to break it up into fifty little files to put it on s different slides, well, this thing you can just you know mark it and then just tell it, save it out as each individual files. Easy enough to do, but nobody thought of doing it because it's such an easy thing. Nobody thought of putting it out there. Mm -hmm. I think the there's a lot of people that I talk to. Oh, does it do that? Really? I said, you didn't know that? Oh, no. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, there's, there's always something to learn, isn't there? So. Oh, there is there is totally something to learn. One, one of my friends had uh, his phone out, and he came to me and said, I'm trying to order a pizza with this app, and I, I can't, you know, it doesn't seem to be working. And, and he always ordered pizza with this app. And I said, uh, hmm. why don't you call them? <laughs> He goes, why? Yeah. Can you do that? Yeah. He said, I, I said, well, call them. Call them. I mean, he's on a phone. <laughs> he's right. seen this app on a phone. And it well, never occurred to him that you could call for pizza as opposed to beeping around on the app, you know? <laughs> so like, <laughs> well, we're the other way around. We would either go to the store or phone up and call and then think, oh, I can do it on, on the app. Because that's the last thing I always think of. I always still like to, I want this. You know, what pizza you want. If you can phone up, you can do it. But I must admit, I've done a few on the, the app, and they're so efficient, though, aren't they? The, you seem to, because sometimes when you phone up, they don't understand what you want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, all online, you, there's no, no mistake in what you want. Well, we, we, we have some lo local places that we can call. We actually can get pizza delivery here from one of the pizza places. And there's a Chinese restaurant uh that's about three or four miles away and we will call and then go down there and pick it up. And, uh, she knows who we are by the sound of our voices. And then she knows whether our daughter is home by what we order. All <laughs> and, right. and so, and so she says, oh, you, daughter, not home. no, 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 she, she isn't home. She, uh, she, she moved to Indiana, you know? So, <laughs> and so, you know, they, they know you by your voice and the, the pizza people are, actual the directions to our house actually shows up on their uh computer whenever they put our phone number in you know our, our, our phone number actually i think is registered when we call pops up on their mm -hmm. computer and then it gives them the actual directions to our house and so um, uh, we did uh, that yesterday and we had a new guy show up but it took him right up to our house you know, so it, it worked out really, really well but yeah like you say you do get to know people we we enjoy the small town feel Instead of just being yeah. one of millions of people in a large city, you know, we actually enjoy getting to know the people around us. So the closest little town to us is called Eleanor. It was actually named after Eleanor Roosevelt, believe it or not. And so we go down there, people know who we are. Like, hey, you know, they might not even know our names, but they know us by face. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you go down there, you show up and, and uh, you know, it's just kind of good to be recognized occasionally. It makes a big difference, and I think we're missing that a lot. And like here, there's the the old corner store, mm. like that's sort of dying out because it's so damn expensive these days. Because in the day, the old like local corner store was the only place you could go to get things, whereas you couldn't go to a supermarket. Well, yes, you could, but if it wasn't Monday to Friday, and before five o'clock, well, that was it. That it. But now there's the supermarkets are open pretty much all the time, mm. any time. So these Call little corner shops. Like I haven't been to our local court for probably last ten years at least. I haven't stepped into it, and it's about fifty feet up the road. Oh wow! It's not fat. It's, it is just on the corner, and mm -hmm. I've never been to that for I would say at least the last ten years. And it's, well, you better hurry. I'm going there before they shut it down. <laughs> oh, 
the thing is, that's the thing is, it, it gets worse and worse, and they don't they have less and less things because you buy a liter, a quarter of milk, what you say, but it's you know fifty cents dearer than it is from the supermarket, and you buy a paper, it's dear, or they don't, no, they don't do papers anymore. It's not worth the money. So yeah. the only thing that people were, because they said no. Nobody's buying paper, so we don't. We've stopped doing them. There's no no point doing them, and even things like fresh bread you used to get there, but then they were charging it was twice as much in there as it was in the supermarket, and it's a wonder that these places are still going. Really? Well, yeah. There's a, there's a lot of them that that don't. I told you that we recently a local uh, store. Our closest store ended up. Uh, it's down there, close to the Chinese restaurant, actually, and it's a uh, it's. They got a new franchise to come in, source from different place, and the prices just went up a lot of them by fifty percent. And it, I mean, you know, they basically priced us out of the store. Uh, my working schedule: there's a Walmart that is that I almost, I mean, I come to an intersection as I'm getting ready to leave work. And if I go straight ahead, I end up on the Walmart parking lot. If I turn to the left, I can go home. And so Walmart's right there. It's open 24 hours a day. And so, you know, once a week when I first start going back to work, I have my wife will either hand me a list before I leave the house or give me a list of what we need. I don't stop every night. I, you know, I want to come home whenever I get done from work, but I will stop and do and do a reasonable store trip at three in the morning, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, whenever nobody's there and, uh, and just go ahead and pick up this stuff on the way home from work and then, uh, you know, come on home. So, you know, it works out. Hey, I was just seeing something else on the internet this week about the, 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 the richest families and it was the Walton family. Yes. And the ones who own the, the Walmarts and that, and it was in the trillions. It wasn't billions. Right. It was in trillions that they had. But I thought, but uh, uh, one one of the employees the other day told me that the uh, reason why that only one or two cash registers are open or something like that was because the uh, Walmart was majority owned by the Chinese, the actual Chinese government. And oh, so right. I was like, I was like, okay, so why is that you know, like, yeah, and, just... yeah. And so so what I did was went ahead and did some did some research online, and it, it said, you know, I mean, you can do the thing where it says, you know is Walmart owned by China and there's mm. articles on it from the last few years is, you know, Walmart majority owned by China. And it turns out it is possible that some Chinese, um, you know, people or some, or the government itself may have some stake in it because stock has been sold, but controlling interest is still held by the Walton family. And mm. so, you know, um, before I got on here and said, ah, uh, you know, Walmart's owned by China, you know, I thought I'd better check it out first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> well, it looks like we've gone through, oh, we've gone past our hour again. So Yeah, yeah. It, we we always, do have a tendency been, to do that. You didn't change the picture, though, this week, did you? Oh, no, no. The picture's the same. I've probably got about six or eight of them, but that's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So, because that's. This is a good shot. We can see all your books, all the the, the T-shirt mm -hmm. yeah, and, yeah. That, and everything in the, in the background there. So oh, exactly. come up really Anyway, thank you again for another exciting hour hour long thing. But uh, we'll have to have what do we say we're calling the show today? It is uh, the Happy Hollisters are still swell. Swell, that's right. Swell. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, every everybody go to thehappyhollisters dot com to uh, look at these books and get a fancy T shirt like the one you see behind me here, and. Uh, mm. Yeah, I, I I love that shirt because it has the actual hand drawn pictures on it that uh, you know are in the books themselves. It's really really cool. But uh, I missed out. I missed out on the Hollister, so I'll have to read them where I, because I missed out on them when I was a kid. You see. So. Oh, definitely. There's all kinds of keen and swell things in there. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> they were written in the fifties, and so like you say, it has a lot of the fifties values which we sorely lack today. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, anyway, there'll be the it'll be the video thing. We'll be talking about that on the video show, which again you're probably watching right now. And then the audio podcast at HolbrookNewMedia dot com will also uh, be the audio of this same show. So uh, you can go and find that stuff. And I'll put the as I said, I'll put the link to the Happy Holler Society in the in the show notes as well. So Sounds good. That. I think I'll come in here and on the first comment after you do that. I have a little background about the books themselves. I'll probably put on the first comment there. Okay, anyway, thanks everybody, and bye for now. 
Thank you so much for listening. Links for a free subscription, feedback, and everything else we do is at holbrooknewmedia.com. You can find all things Jeff Blanchard at jeffblanchard.com.